In the early 1800s, British traders smuggled increasingly large amounts of opium into China in response to low Chinese demand for other goods. In 1839, rising addiction rates led Imperial Commissioner Lin Zexu to take a stand against British drug trafficking. Lin's stand caused the British to protect their opium imports and broader commercial privileges with naval might, leading to a dramatic expansion of the trade he had sought to end. Lin's attempt to drive foreign influence from his country ultimately led to a century-long domination of China by foreign powers. In the mid-18th century, two diametrically opposing commercial worldviews met in the Indian Ocean. The British Empire had turned its attention on Asia after defeat in the American Revolutionary War. Motivated by growing industrial production of manufactured goods and skyrocketing domestic demand for tea, the island nation began to aggressively expand its trading networks in the region. In India and the Java Islands, the British East India Company used private armies to seize huge colonies in an effort to open new markets for trade with the East. The Qing Dynasty in China, by contrast, saw little value in foreign trade. The Chinese Empire was a self-contained continental market with access to almost all necessary resources, and the upper classes were deeply influenced by Confucian philosophy that held merchants in low regard. Feeling they had little to gain from the outside world, Qing officials limited foreign traders to the single coastal city of Canton and refused to buy Western goods. Chinese economy alone counted for about one third of the global economy. So from Chinese perspective, uh, there was no need for China to trade with a country such as Britain. The opium trade was the natural result of the friction between these two perspectives. The British East India Company, facing bankruptcy as it paid for tea imports with costly Spanish silver, sought another way to finance its Chinese operations. In the early 1760s, British smugglers discovered a receptive market for opium from their Indian colonies among the large Chinese coastal upper class. By 1780, opium was the largest foreign import to China. The drug was illegal in China, but local officials were willing to overlook shipments in exchange for a small bribe. In the early 19th century, a precarious balance was established. Chinese trade restrictions checked the drug spread, but the Qing dynasty made no concerted effort to stop the opium trade. The opium trade had been established for only 20 years when a series of historical developments upset the system's delicate balance. In 1817, the British East India Company colonized the Indian state of Malwa, a heartland of opium production. Then, in 1833, the British Parliament abolished the company's monopoly on the drug sale. As competition among British trading houses lowered prices, opium consumption spread to the lower classes. In 1800, total British exports of opium to China had held firm at about 4,000 chests annually. By 1838, more than 40,000 chests of opium poured into Canton and the surrounding area every year. The increase in opium imports had a dire effect on the population of coastal China. As sales skyrocketed, the number of addicted Chinese grew from a few thousand to three million. By the end of the 1830s, a faction of Qing court officials, motivated by the plight of coastal addicts, had emerged as strong opponents of the drug trade. They were led by Lin Zexu, the respected and incorruptible viceroy of the Huguang province. In 1838, Zexu wrote a forceful letter to the Daoguang emperor, demanding the authority to put an end to the importation of opium. Facing political pressure after the discovery of opium paraphernalia in the possession of the crown prince, the emperor agreed. Lin, newly appointed as commissioner of foreign trade, arrived in Canton in the spring of 1839. He posted an open letter to Queen Victoria upon his arrival, warning of dire consequences if the British continued to illegally import opium. The commissioner was unconcerned by the prospect of retaliation. 
Failing to grasp the vital role that the sale of opium played in British commerce, he saw the trading houses that smuggled it as little more than common criminals. He doubted that merchants, marginalized by his own country, could have the political sway to lead their nation to war. You would have thought of Britain as being fairly far away, um, small compared to China, um, kind of a condescending view toward, toward the Europeans. The British traders in Canton ignored Lin's warning. On June 3, 1839, Lin reversed a half century of Chinese foreign policy and unilaterally took a dramatic stand against the British opium trade. Soldiers under the commissioner's command confiscated 70,000 opium pipes and arrested more than 1,700 opium dealers. Zeshu himself led a raid on the cluster of British warehouses just outside Canton. There, he seized and destroyed 2.6 million pounds of opium. After hearing the news of Lin's raid, the British Parliament, lobbied by the influential political operatives of Asian trading houses, dispatched a naval squadron to open China by force. In November, British gunship squadrons began a blockade of Canton. Over the next three years, the industrialized and technologically superior British Navy forced their way far upriver into mainland China. The invaders captured Canton, Nanking, and Shanghai. There were more than 20,000 Chinese casualties at the cost of 69 British Marines. In August of 1842, the Qing Dynasty was forced to sign the Treaty of Nanking. Under the treaty, European traders were no longer limited to Canton, but could dock in any of five coastal cities. More strikingly, the island of Hong Kong was ceded to Queen Victoria as an imperial colony. Smugglers now had a base of operations less than a mile from the coast. After the British took Hong Kong, they had a free reign. The British used Hong Kong as the bridge head to dump opium in the China market. By 1850, the number of chests smuggled in annually had more than doubled, from 40,000 to 96,000. The number of addicts was increased by a factor of 10 to 30 million, more than 10% of China's population. Commissioner Lin's stand against the opium trade had backfired spectacularly. Underestimating both the military strength of his opponents and the significance of the drug trade in British commerce, he had attempted to free China from opium and only increased its omnipresence. Even the commissioner's own government turned against him. In the war's aftermath, the emperor issued an edict banishing Lin to the north. The evil was not eradicated. The importation of opium along the coast was by no means stopped. All these were caused by the incompetency of Lin Zexu. Commissioner Lin's failed stand against British opium imports demonstrated to the world that China was unable to defend itself against colonial intrusion, beginning a period that would become known as the Century of Humiliation. For 300 years, the Qing government had been viewed as too strong to colonize. The failure of the Chinese to resist the British proved otherwise. You know, I've seen saying they saw the opportunity and saw China how that easily become a really big pie for any um, colonial powers to take. In the first 10 years after Lin's stand, China was compelled by military force to sign treaties granting territorial and trading rights to the British, French, Americans, Norwegians, Swedish, and Russians. Eight years later, the British, French, and Americans launched a second opium war forcing the Qing Dynasty to officially legalize the drug trade. Commissioner Lin Zexu's stand against British opium imports led to the British seizing colonial privileges through violence, causing a dramatic expansion of the trade he had sought to end. Ultimately, Lin's failed stand demonstrated China's growing weakness, causing a century-long surge of imperialism in his country.